My whole lifestyle has changed completely because ever since I started Passy Hawks back in Detroit and everyone that I've met, we've made multiple projects. I've seen most, like a lot of cities that I've never seen before. Um, traveled outside the country. My music dynamic has changed. My thought process has changed. I feel like I learned what I came here to learn exactly. Also, it was really interesting just listening to like people from my generation, what we're all kind of doing. If you want to find you know, producers in your city, you gotta go to Pass the Ox because it's the best way to network, it's the best way to get your music known because now you have a whole community of people who are doing the exact same thing as you, who are in the exact same boat as you, and in this industry, you need help from other people. Yo, yo, it's good. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm here right now. Really, uh, I'm really honored to be here. Every time I come to Toronto, I feel like it's my first time. I don't know why. And I was just telling my man Five Piece, like I always get super nervous crossing the customs border people. <laughs> I'm like, I'm always shitting bricks because I feel like, like I have nothing to hide, but like I always try to make up a story. I get like super nervous, but yo, homegirl, just like let me go. Sometimes you get always like, yeah, you can let go. Yeah, story. Better. She looked at my shit, she didn't say one word. She's like, Oh, she actually checked your social media. No, no, she didn't. Oh, okay, she my didn't. bad. I thought you said, like, okay. Go. No, she didn't. Sometimes they do that. That, hap that happened to me um, going into Vancouver. And uh, and she let me go. I didn't have to say anything, so, um, so that was good. I don't know why I just told you guys that just now. <laughs> like, I don't know what you guys are drinking up here. I don't know if it's the maple syrup or the poutine. Whatever you guys are doing up here is working and the quality is amazing. And, and I know I'm putting a lot of pressure on you guys right now, but I'm, I'm really super blown away by the talent up here. And, and, and I love this city so much, even just outside of the talent. It's really one of my favorite cities. It reminds me of New York City, where I'm from, um, minus the rats and the, the garbage on the sidewalk. So how do you know if a track is actually good enough to send to an artist or if you're unsure about it, right? So <clears throat> I think all creatives, our brains work differently from each other. But from my experience, when I'm second guessing something, it just means that I'm fearful of a reaction. And nine times out of 10, that means that I'm creating a track in hopes that everyone will love the track, which is impossible to do. You can't make a track that's 100% flawless to where if you play it for 100 people, all 100 people will love it, right? Uh, and then that goes back to thinking about who's one of the greatest artists of all time that ever lived, Michael Jackson, right? Most of us love him, but believe it or not, he's got millions of people that hate him. Same thing with Bob Marley, Stevie Wonder. They've never successfully created music that every single human being, all seven billion people on earth loved. So it's like, why do we have the audacity and ego to think that we can create this massive, amazing song or piece of music that we think everyone will love, right? And so when you do the math, that doesn't make sense. When you dig deeper into that, all you're really left with is creating music that you love and not giving a shit about who or what or how many people love it. As long as you love it, you'll start to attract people that are on your frequency that love your music. If you play your beat for 10 people and one person likes it and, and the other nine people don't like it, doesn't mean it's not good. It just means that that one person is attracted to your frequency and what you create. If there's one person out there that loves your shit, there's 7 billion people on earth. There's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people out there that will also love your shit. So I know that's a super deep answer, but that is the answer. Right? You Filipino? Yeah, Filipino. My guy, oh my <laughs> god. But the thing is, yo, I'm from yeah. here. I'm from here. That's you it. from here? Yeah, I'm but, from here. But you're from the Philippines, though, too. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> Let me get that one. How much, man? Do you accept uh, Western Union? <laughs> Yeah, there, I love the beat you played because it sounds like 
a beat that someone would make that understands what it's what a rapper wants, yeah. right? Like you being a rapper, I mean, you rap too, right? Both of you guys? No, I don't know. Okay, you don't rap. <laughs> Let me guess, you freestyle every once in a while. I think the consistency comes from uh, social media online, you know? Like, because it's very rare do you get opportunities like this. You know, like if we could do this every day, that would be amazing, but it's very rare to, to find stuff like this. So the only other option we have is a social media. Here, online, what? The neighborhood? I've been emailing artists through SoundCloud, Instagram, everybody. Have you done YouTube yet? I'll be sure what to do that. Right. You said it's like saturated. It's saturated, but that's exactly what you need right now. What you need to do is you're not having any luck finding artists that you mesh with locally, right? So that's out of the question right now. As of right now, I feel like you're not looking hard enough on SoundCloud because there's so many. So you have to you have to stay with it. YouTube, there's a plethora of really shitty artists, but there's also <laughs> some diamonds in the rough that you need to weed out. You know, it's like, it's like we have to go out of our way to look for these people. And that's where this, but one, it's like, you know, the whole diamond in the rough thing I was talking about earlier. You know, it's like our, our job is to find it. And once we find it, man, it's amazing. I think you should dedicate some time every day, man, and looking for these people. Hey man, let's go. Oh my God. God damn fucking potato. I, I totally get the concept now. The fucking robotic priest. Yeah, I hear it. This. That reminded, that was like, I'm on another planet and there's like robots and it was gospel, but it was like kind of like on another planet. Super quality, man. Like this, this deserves to have a cult fan base. So if a, if a major publishing company approaches you to want to sign a publishing deal with you, right? Okay, so um, what do you do at that point? Music publishing is basically our golden ticket. As music producers, writers, singers, rappers, music publishing is where our um, worth uh, exists, right? It's like real estate. Every time we make a beat or make a song and it gets streamed on YouTube or Spotify or downloaded, um, it starts to generate value. Right, and even if it's like pennies on the dollar, it's still generating value. And so if you're getting millions of streams or you have like a hundred songs out there that have a thousand streams each, all those pennies add up to a certain amount. And so that money is owed to you. It's publishing companies and their job is to step in and collect the money for you. Uh, and in return, they take a percentage or they retain a certain percentage of ownership. And in return, they'll collect, distribute, and they'll collect globally, you know, as opposed to if you sign with an independent publishing company based in Canada, they might not have the resources to collect in those territories. And those are smaller companies. So long story short, uh, if you're signing uh, a publishing deal with a major company like a Universal or Sony or Cobalt, chances are your publishing is worth a pretty good amount. You know, rarely do these people sign writers who don't have that much of a publishing value. And so when you get to that point where you're ready for a publishing deal, the first thing you should do is hire an attorney because they're gonna present you a contract that's 50 to 100 pages that you can't read on your own that you shouldn't sign the first draft on. So hire an attorney that knows what they're doing, number one. And that shouldn't be that hard because there's a lot of attorneys out there that are willing to work with you pro bono to um, negotiate that deal for you for a percentage. So an attorney will step in and say, oh, you got a Rihanna placement coming? You don't have a publishing deal? You don't have a manager? Cool, I'll do this transaction for you for 5% and I'll negotiate on your behalf and uh, everyone will be happy, we'll all get paid and that would be that. The next thing you wanna think about is what kind of deal you're signing. So uh, as of right now, there's two different types of uh, deals that are out there and there could be more, but the two popular ones that I know of are an MDRC publishing deal and a term deal. An MDRC is basically a song deal. Hey Lyric, so we know you have a, a track on Rihanna's new album and we wanna sign you to a five song MDRC deal with us and we're gonna give you $500,000. So here's what really happens. So 
Five songs means that you need to fulfill five songs in order to get out of the contract. So you have to deliver five songs of placement, five placements basically. So they're gonna cut you a check for 250K and then the other 250K will be, be released after you fulfill the songs. So if you fulfill one song out of five, they'll give you 50K. In your mind, you're like, oh, okay, I got the Rihanna placement. Cool, I got four more songs, right? So when we create a song as a producer, writer, rapper, you look at the song as a 100% sort of like pie, right? Like the Domino's pizza pie. And that pie is broken up into pieces based on who contributed to the song. By default, every song, it's split into two um, parts, right? So 50% one part, 50% the other part. The first part of the song is the publishing portion of the song. The other half of the pie is the writer portion of the song, okay? So the writer portion is split into two parts as well. You have the writer composer and you have the writer performer. These are the people that write the song, these are the people that perform the song. So Rihanna, in this case, would take that portion, the writer performer portion. So what are you left with? You have 25%, well you have 100% of the writer performer, which is half of the writer portion, which is what, 25% of the whole pie. So Rihanna would take 50% of the writer performer and Amnesia would take 50% of the writer performer as well, which is 12.5, 12.5, right? You guys follow me? Yeah. Okay, cool, so that's done. So we look at the writer composer. The writer composer is the producer. You get 100% of the writer composer portion, which is 25% of the whole pie. Right, so then that 50% of the pie is done. So then what's the other half, the publishing portion, right? So the publishing portion really is, it's a mirror image of what you walk away with from the writing portion. And then Rihanna, 12.5 on the writer performer, 12.5 on the publishing. Amnesia, 12.5 writing performer, 12.5 publishing. So with this one song, you've just fulfilled 25% of 100%. Five songs could turn into 20, and then you can be stuck in that deal for the rest of your life. And not to mention, by the way, that 250 that we cut you a check for, you have an attorney that just took 5% of the 250, which is uh, how much? I'm terrible at math. Hey, you guys Asians, you guys know? <laughs> My guy over here. 12, so 12,500, gone. Uh, let's say you have a manager, 20%. So 20% of 250 is 50 grand. All right, so let's just say 60 grand so you're down to 190 grand, right? But guess what? You made over 100 grand or so. I think I don't know what the law is. So your tax bracket is 40 something percent. So you could expect to pay 40 something percent of that 190 you walked away with in taxes, which by the way, most people don't do because they forget or they don't have an accountant and they spend money on a chain and then they're like, fuck, I gotta pay my taxes. Now you're technically left with around $95,000 that you need to stretch for the next X amount of years, depending on how long it takes you to fulfill that songs, those songs. That's why people get caught up in the MDRC deal because they don't realize how long it takes and they blow their money on shit and then they're broke, you know? And you're not getting another check until you fulfill those songs. The other type of deal is a term deal where instead of songs, it's years. So let's say they offer you the same deal, but they, they want to sign you to like a three year term deal. Then what happens is they'll release the money based on the year. As long as you're fulfilling your, um, your debt every year, you're publishing. They're weighing risk against how much they're spending. But a lot of times publishing companies will never go in the red. So if they offer you 500 grand, that means you're already worth double. That Rihanna, they know that that Rihanna song is gonna generate more than a million dollars. So from the day you signed the deal, they're already in the green. Cause they already ma they made their money back and they're only giving you half, so they're good. Oh, that you don't need a publishing deal for, you still have to do publishing regardless. You don't have to do a publishing deal, but what you should do is do a deal where they're collecting for you. 
They need to, you need a, a publishing company to administer your publishing, collect it, and distribute it to you. You know, you need, you need that. You know, but you can, you can go in there with leverage. There's people out there that don't have deals that are retaining 100% ownership. They have admin deals and they're collecting. You sure you were high, man? That was fire. Yeah, I was expecting like some crazy, like I'm so high. I just Cow used bells cowbells everywhere. everywhere. The entire thing. That was like controlled. Like that was like very organized. Like the chord, like all the chords were like proper chords. No clashing bass. Like the mix was great. You should probably smoke more and get <laughs> fucked up. Jeez. That was like a Bruce Lee kick to the face real quick. That was fire, man. That's all I gotta say, fire. This is where Kanye comes in. Huh? I'm doing like, scaling it to where it's like a hundred people That's what I mean. in an arena That's what and then then it's like what am I doing this for you know like I just want to like sit with people and like really dig in the sweet spot right now is like 20 to 30 um, and it's like it's cool you know and, and yeah so it's just a lot of fun man okay it's, it's so really we'll cool. get something to eat uh, for I'll, sure I'll